This is the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 8th, 2024. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we're talking this week here from Phoenix about what's been going on in the area of federal taxes. We're going to start with a discussion of a report that was in the Washington Post and some other publications regarding some new work in progress to try to obtain a bipartisan tax bill that could be passed early in 2024 and that apparently would have at least some items in it that would retroactively impact 23 returns, which I know is something you probably are all looking forward to, having those sorts of late changes and most likely delays in time to be able to electronically file returns, assuming they do it. But we'll talk about what they're talking about and also not really a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination, but we'll at least give a discussion. We talk about the fact the IRS gave car dealers a brief extension of time to file time of sale reports for the EV credits. Uh, it turns out the IRS new program isn't working quite as smoothly as they had hoped, so there is some additional time being put in there. And in fact, this extension for at least a report in tax notes today may very well not be the last extension of time here because according to the Tax Notes Day report, the IRS is kind of hoping to get all of this working by February. And we'll discuss how the current extension only gets us to January 16th. So we'll talk about where we end up there. We're also going to talk about the IRS reversing direction on the treatment of the impact of adding a tax reimbursement clause to an intensive defective grant or trust. In a 2016 private letter ruling, the IRS had ruled that if you added that, it made no difference. Uh, basically, it didn't change anything. There was no gift tax issues that were brought up by doing that. Now the IRS is saying, well, we, we've reconsidered. We'll talk about the impact of that, uh, you know, where we stand and uh, what impact might be there. And some of the things that, uh, you know, that... Previously, we appeared to think was no, no risk whatsoever an IRS challenge that now we're probably going to have to tell clients to make up their minds earlier about whether or not they want to have such a provision in their trust uh, to avoid running into a potential problem with the service. Finally, we'll talk about the, uh, a case that was a reported tax court case, our first one of the year, that where the tax court held that the taxpayer has an absolute right to rely upon the dates the IRS puts in a notice of deficiency uh, for the last day to file a tax court petition if that date is erroneous but in the taxpayer's favor. We'll talk about not only that, but how it doesn't even matter if the IRS discovers the error and one day later sends out an updated notice doesn't change the results of the case, at least apparently per the tax court. So let's start first talking about that apparent new bill we're looking at here, uh, where senior members of the tax writing committees, meaning the chairs and the ranking members of the committees, are reportedly now sitting down and uh, working out a potential deal to get a bipartisan tax bill put together that would extend some provisions through 2023 that each party would like to see extended. Now, by ranking members, I, of course, mean the chairs and the ranking members of the minority party. So in this case, you know, the chairs would be uh, Representative Smith for Ways and Means, uh, Senator Wyden for the Finance Committee, and ranking members would be Representative Neal in the Ways and Means Committee, and Senator Crapo in the Finance Committee. And so this is supposedly talks going between the four of them. Now, that's somewhat important because the key issue is with those four members, that's a group that if they do come to some sort of agreement has a much better chance of getting a bill actually passed and signed into law. Because remember, we have chambers controlled by different parties. Uh, we also have a president who is obviously a member of one of the parties and not the other. Uh, the House struggled this year and was unable to even push out a version of the bill that they wanted to push out. And the House is the easiest uh, chamber to push a bill through because pure majority, all you need is one vote more than the other side and you can get something out. Uh, the House's attempt over the summer to pass four tax bills that would have been the starting point for negotiations uh, flailed and basically collapsed over disputes inside the Republican caucus regarding the uh, state and local tax caps 
And what happened was the idea was those bills were supposed to be a Republican only proposal that would then go on to the Senate, be dealt with, and then we'd get a compromise out of that. That, as I said, failed. Those never made it anywhere. And it doesn't seem likely that a Republican only bill can make it anywhere until the caucus can at least solve their salt problem. Because we actually have a smaller Republican majority today with some people who have left recently and whose seats have not yet been refilled um, than we had back in the summer when this whole thing blew up to begin with. So the idea is our only option for a tax bill is probably to get a one drafted from the start that is the bipartisan bill we expect to move with, not starting as we often had with a House bill that's written primarily to be in line with what the majority party wants in there, whether it's been the Republicans or the Democrats. So it's a little different, but this would be the way a bill would have to come down. Now, the reports are there's $100 billion that's been allocated and supposedly evenly between the Democrat and Republican favorite extenders. But there's at least one report the Washington Post pointed out, at least one of their sources said, that may be more of a cap than a goal. So it may be that they're saying, you know, we reach a deal, it can't go above $100 billion, uh, but not that it's going to be $100 billion, that there may be a push to reduce it. And actually, their report was that Senator Crapo is the one that is the, uh, let's say, toughest to bring along at this point among the four uh, to come up with doing a bill of this sort. Now, some of the provisions they're talking about would be including a 174 revision for 23. And it does appear the way they wrote it, it would be 23 only, which means you would not go back and recover 22's amounts that you had been unable to write off. And so you only therefore amortized effectively one-tenth of what you spent last year, pick up one-fifth, or I should say in 20, which you spent 22, pick up one-tenth in 23, and so on and so forth. Uh, but rather, you get to write off everything incurred in 23, but absent future action, we would again be back to having to amortize in 24. Also, there's a discussion for a depreciation fix to get full bonus. Again, that may be for 23. You know, we'll get the 23 version, which is great, but then we go back and in 24, we're back to you know the reduction levels we were already planning to get to. Also looking at an expanded child tax credit, again, apparently for one year. So these are all interesting things, but they do mean that the end of 23 or the end of 24, we're back with the same problem. And the article does go on to discuss the bigger problem that's coming up in 25 uh, when we have a bunch of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act items leave the bill. Now, it's not clear in this case if this bill came to pass how it would be paid for. The only mention they put in the article as to how to come up with $100 billion, because presumably this needs to be offset, would be an early end to the employee retention tax credit, because that, that, that appears to be now a program that there aren't a whole lot of people who are really hard behind in the Congress, that it may, you know, it's seen now as essentially a rampantly fraudulent program, is I guess the way you're kind of looking at it with a basic public perception today. And so based on that, the feeling probably is they could cut the program off. And by cutting it off, we mean just saying, if you haven't applied for your credit, uh, you know, tough luck. Not sure if they'll go there, but that would be kind of an obvious fundraising direction to go if they wanted to. So that might mean if you have any clients that realistically qualify for 21, but haven't filed their claims, you might want to start thinking about getting them together. I'll phrase it that way. It's also not clear how mechanically they'd get the bill through the chambers. They apparently have not yet decided if they'll try to attach it to a must-pass bill. Uh, that's actually more difficult these days than it had been in the past for the simple reason that we had very, very few bills passed last year. And obviously, there's, you, know, you have a few bills that have to pass, but not a whole lot. And it's going to be tougher to get them there because things like, and the obvious thing here would be a spending deal in January. Well, that's likely to come down the last second again. And it's unlikely they're going to want to muck that up by trying to throw this tax bill on at the last second. You know, they're going to want to get the votes for the spending bill. And my guess is they're going to like that bill to not have extra stuff they're not currently talking about in it. They don't want to complicate it any more than they have to. So the other option is to try to float it through as a standalone bill, but that also runs into trouble with what 
you know, whatever various members of leadership want to do. And as well, you know, you just need a couple of members who want to throw, you know, let's say, throw a fit, especially in the Senate. And you could have these bills put on hold indefinitely. So who knows what somebody would get upset about. So that makes it a little more interesting, even if you have relatively, you know, a large majority of the, you know, of the chamber wants to pass it. So that could also become a problem. Now, Bloomberg and Punchbowl News had similar stories uh, in a report found on Joe Christian's tax news and views uh, through Ide Bailey that was posted on January 5th. So this isn't simply a post story. There are other reports of this happening. But remember, it's far from certain that this is going to happen. Um, you know, they are, obviously we. This is probably a better chance than anything we've seen in a long time. Probably a better chance than anything we've seen uh, since the end of 2022, and probably even a better chance than what we saw right there at the end of 2022 uh, for the extenders bills. But that still doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's still going to be a difficult run. So just keep your eyes on it. Remember, it's possible something will happen, but right now. All we can say is it might happen. Next up, IRS News Release 2024-02, issued January 5th of 2024. And what this news release related to was the time of sale reports that dealers are required to file under Revenue Procedure 2023-38 related to the ability to get paid for the uh, clean vehicle credit, right? Remember, you're now the option in 24. If I'm going down and buying a clean electric vehicle that qualifies for either the $7,500 or $3,750 credit, I can, if I otherwise qualify for that credit, so I have my incomes low enough, right? Remember, we have that in either 22 or 20, in either 23 or 24, then I could qualify for this credit on my return. But instead of taking, instead of doing it that way, what I can do in 24 is assign the assign the money to the dealer, and the dealer will file this essentially time of sale report, and will be able to reduce the cost to me immediately of the car, apply it to a down payment, reduce the cost of the car, uh, give me cash, but in any event, be able to have it currently. Now the idea the IRS had put in this was we were going to have these filings of these point of sale reports submitted through the IRS Energy Credits online website. Unfortunately, there have been reports that this hasn't all been going super well for the IRS. So it's both submitting on the site and also getting paid. The Tax Notes Today article, a Tax Notes Today article that was written by Alexander Rippett, uh, notes that there have been, the IRS has conceded they've missed the 72 hour turnaround time. For certain reports filed on January 1st and January 2nd, they should have been paid out by the 5th, which was Friday, and the service failed to meet that date on at least some of those filed reports. So there definitely are issues all around, and obviously the quick turnaround is somewhat important for this program, because remember the dealer is going to take, going to take the hit on reducing the sales price by that $3,750 or $7,500. And, you know, the IRS is going to be, you know, kind of filling that in by giving them funds. And if those funds aren't arriving on time, that's kind of a problem as well. So there's going to be a pushback. So what the news release tells us is that any sales of a car made through January 16th can be submitted to the program as late as January 19th. Now, that doesn't really solve the payment problem. Uh, but the IRS maybe thinks they can get that solved. They do note that any dealer should probably try to submit at the time of sale and only take advantage of this extension if, in fact, they're unable, only for ones that they are unable to make go through the process, which there are various issues being reported, but otherwise submit. And I'm sure part of that is, assuming they can fix the three-day three -day payment window, obviously you'll get paid faster if you submit it today than if you wait until January 19th, right? Now, now the other interesting thing noted in that Tax Notes Today article by Alexander Riffett was um, the IRS hopes to, the IRS says they hope to revert to the three-day reporting requirement by February. 
Now, since this only covers you know, relief through the middle of January, that kind of raises the question of, are they telling us they're expecting at least some variant of this report, some relief of some odd sort to take place again? So in essence, we get to January 16th, we're not just going back to the, to the, revenue, you know, the revenue procedure we had issued late last year. We're going to instead be going back to whatever new relief they have heading into potentially the beginning of February. So if you're involved as a car dealer, uh, keep your eye on this. We expect things to keep happening over the next month and hopefully just over the next month. Next up, we have IRS Chief Counsel Advice 2023, uh, 2023-52018, right? That was issued on December the 29th of 23. Obviously, with the 52 in there, it's the last week of the year. So this came out right at the end of 23. And it deals with intentionally defective grantor trust. Now, you're not used to what that is. They're involved in estate planning and they're used in certain cases. And what the term means is income generated from assets in a grantor trust are treated as if the assets was owned by the grantor. Therefore, the income deductions related items for those assets are reported directly on the grantor's return. Now, that means the grantor is going to pay the income tax on the item. However, because the rules are different under the estate tax and, and gift tax rules, you can structure a trust to be a grantor trust for income tax purposes, but still have it treated as a completed gift and out of the grantor's estate for estate tax purposes. Conceptually, this is used because the IRS has not taken the position in the past that a payment of the income taxes by the grantor represents an additional gift to the beneficiaries of the trust. That means that by paying the taxes his or her, him or herself, the grantor effectively is making a larger gift to the beneficiaries because those income taxes are coming out of the grantor's estate and they are not coming out of the trust that would reduce how much effectively goes to those beneficiaries. So we're essentially getting a boost on our gift. Now that means preferably we have assets in that would be at lower tax rates. Preferably we would work to not having too much churn among the assets to reduce capital gains and the like that are taxed. You know, we, we, we want to manage it some. But nevertheless, the concept here is to do that. And alternatives to this, like, an, like let's say a life insurance trust, um, that problem there is there are other expenses incurred. And as I tell people, remember, life insurance is always put together as a game, where at least on the death benefit, clearly, if the insurance company knows what they're doing, you, in theory, are probably worse off having paid into it. Because again, if the insurance company doesn't understand how to properly underwrite the policy, uh, there's probably going to be a problem eventually with getting paid out. Right? They need to understand how to properly underwrite the policy. If they don't understand what they're insuring, we have a problem. Um, so it insures against risk. Life insurance portion of death benefit insures against the risk that you die prior to the point at which we could earn out what we would transfer anyway. And in, because of that, and because the insurance company is taking that risk, and they are, they're taking a risk, because you die the next day, that entire you know, death benefit gets paid out, they end up charging for that. Right? There is a charge incurred, there are administrative costs incurred, and it can be more expensive. So the concept being is we, we could use a, an intentionally defective grant or trust, and the income taxes may effectively, especially when we look at the estate tax benefit of the additional transfers uh, in that situation, can work out being preferable to what we end up with if we go through the life insurance trust, the irrevocable life insurance trust. And so conceptually it works. But the problem is sometimes grantors get a little nervous because, okay, I signed up for this, but now I'm worrying, do I have enough to live on, et cetera? Is this a bad move? Could I owe taxes? Am I getting upset with the taxes I'm paying on the amounts being earned in the trust? And so sometimes they would like to undo things. Now in private letter ruling 2016-47001, the IRS held that you could add a tax reimbursement clause after the initial adoption of the trust 
assuming that you got, you know, obviously the grantor can't retain this right, but the grantor could have a, you know, have the beneficiaries all agree to allow the trust to be revised in order to add this to it. And they said, well, if you did that, there would not be any deemed gift from the beneficiaries to the grantor. It wouldn't open up any question about the grantor trust being included in part or in whole in the grantor's estate. Based on that, for the past seven years, uh, advisors have been, you know, will sometimes run into these clients that suddenly are now concerned about, oh, oh, horrible. What if there's a huge tax inside the trust? I'll have to pay all that tax. Oh, that'd be awful. Okay, so you calm them down by saying, well, what we can do is we can go this route if everybody will agree, and we could add this reimbursement clause, allow the trustee, you know, in certain conditions to be able to reimburse you for the taxes, calm down the grantor, et cetera. And because of this private letter ruling, uh, you know, the theory was, well, you know, the IRS is going to challenge the structure. Unfortunately, it is just a private letter ruling. That's something you always have to remember. It doesn't really bind the IRS except for that one particular taxpayer. But more the point, whenever you have these, you know, any of this stuff issued, you have to realize that the IRS might change their mind. And now we run into just that. In Chief Counsel Advice 2023-52018, the IRS is going to change its mind. Now, all of this goes back to, let's talk about Revenue Ruling 2464. That which is a revenue ruling. The IRS can't just get rid of that with the Chief Counsel Advice. Um, it ruled back in 2004 that you could have a tax reimbursement clause in an intensely defective grant or trust, and that would not cause this to be considered to be not a fully complete gift to the beneficiaries made by the, made by the donor at that time. They, they could have that in there, that, that particular clause, they would either mandatorily or at discretion of the trustee be reimbursed for the taxes that were paid. And, you know, so great. The private letter ruling has simply expanded upon that and said, okay, there's no problem if you add that later. Now the IRS has issued the chief counsel advice that essentially argues that Revenue Ruling 2004-64 only applies, you know, you know, you can't take the concepts of that and apply it to a modification of the trust. This has to be the trust as it's originally set up. If you later modify the trust, even if you get all the beneficiaries to agree the modification, there, that's going to be considered a gift from the beneficiaries back to the grantor. And that's going to create a potential for a gift tax filing, potential for gift tax if it's a big enough trust. But also, you know, the problem that does it mean that some are, you know, some are all of the grantor trust is now deemed to be back in the estate of the grantor. If there's been a gift made and that gift is the interest of some sort and that interest then will pass back to the beneficiaries when the grantor dies, uh, you know, that, that right to take funds from the trust, um, that does open up the question of what happens at the estate tax return filing. Now, the IRS does admit that this presents a very complex valuation problem, which it does, right? How do we value? Okay, so we added this clause saying they might pay income taxes. What's the value of that? You know, how much of the trust did the beneficiaries effectively give back to the grantor, knowing that we have no idea how much tax will be paid? And if it's a discretionary uh, function, we don't know if it's ever going to be used. So how do you value that? All the footnote says is, yeah, that, that's complicated, but merely the fact it's complicated doesn't mean there hasn't been a gift, et cetera, et cetera. So the IRS is going to start arguing. That obviously doesn't help us because if we don't know how much we're exposed to, uh, that makes us a little nervous about what will the IRS argue the first time if this appears before them in court, what's going to be their argument, and what will the tax court buy as the argument? Again, a lot of unknowns in this mix. It complicates matters. Okay. As I say, how much is in the grantor's estate? That's a huge question at this point. Is part of it back there? So what do we do going forward? Well, essentially, if the, if the interest you know, was added, this type of clause was added between 2016 and during 2023, so in that time period where it was possible, you know, and people were relying upon that private letter ruling, 
kind of seems like my first thought, we're kind of stuck. I guess, you know, the, the grantor could gift it back, you know, basically give up that right, turn it back over. That could, again, be a taxable gift, right? Because we don't know how much is it. We don't know how much came over, so we don't know how much goes back, which opens up the question, is that going to make us better off or worse off? Unknown. I suppose you could make the gift. You could put a valuation in. You could let the clock run for three years and hope everything goes, you know, put in your put in your position and force the service to rule on it. Uh, seems difficult. Maybe people will get private letter rulings on the issue, asking, you know, is it okay for him to give this up? You know, what exactly? But again, the problem there is not so much the law, it's the facts. What exactly is the valuation? Obviously, going forward, I think uh, council will be much less likely to recommend uh, the solution of adding a tax reimbursement clause. Again, because unless you want to litigate the issue, you know, if challenged, uh, that makes this an if your thing to pull up. But yeah, it's also, though, a good reminder that when you have these sorts of unofficial guides, you're relying on a private letter ruling or you're relying on even the chief counsel advice. Uh, remember that these are temporary. And if the tax position and whenever done with the state taxes, this is a long, very long term tax position until the taxpayer dies. There's a chance the IRS could change their mind. And again, what matters is what the court says works based on the IRS's position at the date the grantor dies. So, you know, the IRS, the IRS might have been wrong in 2016. The law really didn't work that way. Well, that's fine, but only one person got to rely upon that IRS position. And now in 2023, they changed their mind. Well, we won't know for sure until a court case comes up of whether the IRS was right in 16 or they're right now. Uh, but for the interim, yeah, there, there's a real risk doing this. So an interesting and odd case. Uh, keep in mind about what the IRS is doing. But yeah, they changed their mind. Next up, the case of Dodson versus Commissioner, our first reported tax court decision of 2024. And remember, a reported decision means we're talking about something here the tax court has not ruled upon previously. However, this is now then reviewed. It's been subject to a review by all of the tax court judges. And since there is no dissenting opinions here, they effectively all agreed with this position. And this position will be, therefore, followed by the tax court in every case. So if the IRS doesn't like this position, wants to see something else done with it, they would need to take this case or a similar case to a court of appeal and have that court of appeal uh, end up issuing the ruling on whether or not the tax court is correct on this. So what's our issue here? Well, Taxpayer received a notice of deficiency from the IRS related to an exam that was mailed on October 7th of 2021. Now, as you know, the notice of deficiency always has on it a statement about, you know, if you wish to, you can pay this up now, you know, you, you can, or you can file a petition in tax court by and list a specific date that you should file a petition by in order to be able to challenge the notice of deficiency. Now, weirdly enough, in this case, the IRS made a major error. And the stamp date put on the notice of deficiency sent to the taxpayer on October 7th said the taxpayer had until December 5th of 2022 as the last date to file a tax court petition to challenge the notice of deficiency. Obviously, that is way more than 90 days after the date that the notice of deficiency was issued. It's over a year after the date the notice of deficiency was issued. So the IRS, a day later, notices the problem. So somebody caught this immediately. But the letter was already out to the taxpayer. So the IRS sent a corrected version of notice of deficiency that now showed January 6, 2022 as the last date to file a petition with the tax court. What happens in this case, the taxpayer, who claims they never received the second notice, and by the way, U.S. Postal Service records seem to back up the fact it never made it to the taxpayer. While the tracking information for the first letter from the IRS shows delivery to the taxpayer, the tracking information for the second letter 
just kind of dies with U.S. Postal Service in El Paso. So apparently it made it from the office that was issuing the notice. Uh, the taxpayers lived in New Mexico, so it made it to the El Paso Post Office and then did nothing. So it died out. But the question becomes now in this case, because they filed their petition in March of 2022. So these guys filed a petition that clearly is well more than 90 days after the petition, after the notice was issued. It's, however, well before December 5th of 2022, the date on their notice of deficiency, and apparently the only one they ever received. But it's also way after the January 6th date, notice of deficiency, uh, which the IRS, you know, basically was the correct date. So the question becomes, does the taxpayer have a right to continue to challenge this notice of deficiency in the U.S. tax court or not? And of course, the IRS says no. They say this was filed after the 90th day, why we call them 90 day letters. And because it was that late, filed after the 90th day, um, the tax court has no jurisdiction. Now, the tax court does agree that if you file after that date, they have no jurisdiction. This particular case would go to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, if the taxpayer appealed the decision. And while we have the, uh, you know, we basically have the Third Circuit case we've discussed previously regarding the fact that the Third Circuit believes that the tax court, or that essentially the IRS has the right uh, to, you know, file, to basically not, or the IRS, not the tax court has, you know, does have to consider equitable relief for a late filing. Um, the reality is that. The tax court has already told us, now we know for sure, that they believe they don't have that right. So IRS is not going to file in the case is Colt First Commissioner of Internal Revenue from the Third Circuit in July of last year. The IRS only needs to follow Culp and consider equitable relief in the Third Circuit. So that, that part goes good for the IRS because obviously, you know, what we have here is you know, let's say, yeah, our facts are taxpayer receives this notice, right? Has this date far in the future. They never received the second notice. But if the IRS is correct that regardless of that first notice, the 90 day rule applies, then outside the Third Circuit, it would be just tough. You know, the uh, tax court would have to rule that, in fact, they have no ability to hear this case even though the IRS had told the taxpayer this erroneous date that, well, that's a problem. You can't rely on them. However, the tax, this was the last thing that was going to break well for the IRS because the tax court was not going to hold that that first notice is what, that, that they could ignore that first notice. The IRS disagreed with the IRS position, stating that while agreeing that they couldn't offer equitable relief, if the taxpayer had filed after the date the petition had to be filed, the tax court couldn't hear the case. And, you know, we don't know if the Tenth Circuit would agree with that or not. But they said the last sentence of IRC Section 6213 specifically allows and provides that the taxpayer must file their petition no later than the date shown on the IRS notice as the last date for filing. That sentence does not say that date, you know, has to be within 90 days, has to be, let's say, the 90th day after the date shown. Now, obviously, if it was short, let's say they, they had said October 7th of 2021, but they had stamped on there, oh, you got to file this by, you know, January 6th of 2020, uh, you know, the court would almost certainly say, yeah, that's wrong. 90 days is in that portion as well. So they have to get at least the 90 days. However, in this case, um, the IRS gave a later date. So the court says initially, no, the IRS, guess what? IRS, nope, they have till December of 22 to file this. And they filed well in advance of that date, about nine months in advance of it. So they're fine. But then the question becomes, but what about that immediately followed up corrected notice that did show the date? I mean, now, you know, we already said, you know, first thing is, do we care? 
because it was sent certified mail to the taxpayer's last known address. Um, you know, I mean, doesn't that count? And tough luck that they didn't get it, but, you know, tough luck things happen. They need to go get, maybe get uh, relief with an offer and compromise, equitable relief. They could pay the tax and sue in tax court, but whatever, they'd just be out of luck potentially. But here the court said, and the position they use here, it doesn't matter if that second thing had been delivered. Under Internal Revenue Code Section 6212D, the IRS can only issue a, a revised notice of deficiency if the taxpayer agrees to the withdrawal of the first one. Right? 6212D provides the taxpayer must agree to withdraw the notice. Absolutely clear that the taxpayer never agreed to withdraw this notice. You know, they didn't get the notice, they didn't get the second notice, and the IRS never asked for them for an agreement to withdraw the first notice. The tax court said once that first notice was out, the December date was set in stone. Unless the taxpayer had agreed to let the IRS withdraw the first notice of deficiency and supply the second. The court said, it, nothing in the law requires that that revised IRS notice of deficiency, you know, change the tax number on the notice of deficiency. In essence, you can't just correct the first one. You have to withdraw the first one and then substitute a second one if you want to get rid of that date on the first one. And obviously the taxpayer would have very little incentive to agree to a withdrawal that was going to shorten the time they could file in tax court. The IRS said, okay, but forget all of this. Come on. That's clearly so far beyond 90 days that the taxpayer or their counsel had to know that that was error. It's an obvious error. There are other indicators that it should be a much shorter period of time, not until essentially 14 months later. That, that, that's, not, that's not something that's reasonable for the taxpayer to have assumed was the correct date. That's what it said doesn't really matter. The law as written says that you have to consider that particular date. And whatever date shown there is the date you have to follow. So even though that date may be wildly erroneous, the taxpayer gets to follow it. You know, the, the, basically, Congress had determined that it was best that the taxpayer not have to independently confirm the IRS had counted to 90 correctly. And while normally that just solves a problem when, let's say, they somehow accidentally got the 91st day in there, et cetera, the IRS couldn't come back and say, oh, you know, sorry, we put a date in there, but really that's 91 days, not 90 days, because we screwed up our counting. You know, they couldn't get out of that. They said there, there's nothing in the, in the section that says, you know, it only allows as long as it's within, you know, a month or whatever. Once you put that date on there, IRS, it's fixed. That's the date to go to tax court. Now, that said, I would generally not push this unless you have to. Conceivably, I suspect what could have happened was that the taxpayers saw they had until December of 22 to do something. They may have delayed going to the council until well after that date, you know, until basically much after they got the notice. And so council may have filed on this knowing that it was past 90 days, but also knowing those deficiencies showed a much later date. Uh, I would probably avoid this issue if you can, but I also think, you know, the court's right. When you look at the actual text of the law, IRS would have to get the first notice of deficiency withdrawn, and the first notice of deficiency's date would control unless the taxpayer agrees to withdraw. As I said, why would you ever agree to withdraw? This adds additional time for you to make your decision as to whether you want to go to tax court or not. So. No, IRS mistake works to the taxpayer's benefit. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of January the 8th, 2024. Current Federal Tax Developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your state side of CPAs. If you have questions, you can email me, edzollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, you also can follow me on the Connect sites. I do check in with posts on Arizona, New Jersey, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, and Washington sites. And I also uh, do take a look at whatever's posted on Idaho's site. So any of those things, take a look there. You got questions. Otherwise, uh, 
Hopefully you had a good start to your year, your first week of the year. I know a lot of people have trouble getting into a lot of doing a lot of work. I know this past week, you know, it was just me getting some things accomplished, but my office was very quiet. Uh, as a lot of people were just kind of, you know, taking their last few days, they could take time off before tax season ramps up. So we had a lot of that going on. Uh, you know, and I know that kind of goes on with a lot of people this time of year and clients all seem to be gone too. We don't have many calls come in on that, except for one salesperson that wants to apparently take over the janitorial service in her office, who's becoming very insistent. But that, that's a whole nother piece of fun we all tend to have. I look forward, therefore, to seeing you next week as we discuss more current federal tax developments.